Heidi knows me, so I won't give you much of a background, but if you want more of a background, I'm happy to give you that at another time. No, um, that's okay. That's good. That's good. <laughs> I trust that. Yeah. And I kind of know why you're here too, um, that you work with the school. So I'm sure this will be really relevant. And I didn't ask what, what you do there at, at the integrated school. Well, uh, more uh, pertinent would be that we had 15 children last year who had lost parents. Yeah. And, um, and I, I never know what to say to them, really. I have no idea how to, and I'm so happy that you're doing this. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, I will tell you, this evening is going to be really the, you know, how we, how we help those kids. Last week, a lot what I talked about was just the background of, you know, age appropriate responses to grief. And um, I mean, that's very, very relevant. And I definitely will touch on that in just a second. Looks like I can share. Perfect. Let's see. Do you all see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. And do you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Awesome. Um, I think if you if you put a slide on, yes, there you go. Is that good? Okay. Yeah. I laugh because I have two computer screens here, and I never know which one is showing for sure. So this is like the blind leading the blind sometimes when I present. <laughs> So just kind of re, um, re going over what we talked about last week um, of what causes grief. Any loss or change in our lives can cause grief. And I think it's really important right now to especially remember that, that we are all grieving something during this time. Um, I, I think I said earlier, piece of you, that I work with adults as well. And I was talking with some adults who had had a special person who died um, earlier today. And we, they were just talking about the heaviness of their grief. And, um, you know, the way I look at it right now is those of us who've had a special person or a loved one or a pet or a significant death loss in our life, we're definitely grieving. The other piece of that is just the collective grief of our country, of our world, of what we're going through right now. Kids are not immune to that. They know that. They know that something is going on. They know that something is different, that their lives have changed as well. And so I think it's really important to just keep in mind that any change in our life and in a child's life can really, really cause grief. And so there's a lot of different things that can cause grief then when you think about it. Um, obviously the death of a special person, a loved one, someone they were close to, that's going to cause grief. Divorce, uh, separation, if a loved one is incarcerated, um, just the changes of the life that we have right now during the pandemic and how that can definitely cause grief in children's lives. Um, but keeping in mind that what we talk about today is specific to death loss. Uh, however, that can definitely be applied to any loss or change in their lives. But I think if we can just kind of keep that in our minds of what causes grief, that change causes grief, I think that we're, we're better off than being able to help um, children. The other thing that I don't have a slide for that I mentioned last week uh, was really just where, what is your comfort level with talking about death and loss and grief? And what is your comfort level talking to children about that? And so really kind of taking, um, doing maybe a personal assessment of how comfortable you are with that. And I think um, that's really important to do when we're working with kids, because if we're not comfortable talking about it, one, we're most likely going to avoid it altogether and just not talk about it. Or if we're uncomfortable with it, we may not be able to support them the, the way that they need. And so that's when it might be appropriate to reach out for help from someone else. And so just doing that self-evaluation of your comfort level uh, of where you are comfortable or what you're comfortable with, with talking about grief and loss um, with children and just in general. So this is just a really quick snippet of um, grief responses by age. And what I tell people really, honestly, we need to just think about where that child is developmentally, where are they at in just understanding life in general and learning different things. And so obviously the younger the child is, the less they're going to really completely grasp 
the idea of grief and loss. And really, as a child gets older and they're, they get to know about life more, they have more life experiences, they're going to also learn about death more and understand grief a little bit better. And so the main things to think about with children that really are kind of the core um, areas that they're going to understand is the permanency of death, the, the ability, uh, the permanency, the, the meaning of uh, when, our, when we die, it means our bodies have stopped working, but also the, that every living thing will eventually die. Those are the three main things that we wanna think about when we're thinking about children and their understanding. When you look at preschool children or very young, toddler age even, um, their concept of death is very different, but that does not mean that they don't understand it or that we should exclude them from the discussions about death and grief and loss. Um, their understanding is going to be very small. So the permanency of death is going to be very confusing for them. If we think about um, their life experience, it's very short, only a couple years where someone like myself, it's 30 some odd years. And so my understanding of life is very different. And so the permanency of it is going to be harder for a child this young to understand because they just don't understand the permanency of life in general or the long um, periods of life. And so they also would be very curious about what does it mean when someone dies or when something dies? And so talking with them about how the body stops working. I was uh, meeting with a four-year-old the other day, and uh, I, you know, one of the first questions I like to ask very young children is, what does it mean when we say someone has died? What does that mean exactly? And a lot of times I start with just the facts of it means the body stops working. They can't feel, they can't breathe, they can't see, um, and just getting their understanding of death. And that's especially important with very young children. Um, but really children uh, up until the age of 10, you know, asking them, what does it mean when we say that someone has died? Um, just so we get a better understanding of their understanding. When you look at children five to nine years old, they're going to understand the permanency of death a little bit more. They're going to understand that when something dies, it cannot come back and that eventually every living thing will eventually die. Um, this is also the age where you'll see them with more of that, maybe that separation anxiety, or just that worry that if my, this loved one died, how do I know someone else isn't going to die? And that's especially concerning if that was a caregiver that died. Um, and so their main concern might be, who is going to take care of me now? And so just reassuring them that their safety um, is very, their safety is important to them. And so letting them know that they are taken care of, even if their other caregiver, if something were to happen to them, there's still people who will take care of them. And so letting them know that um, and reassuring them as much as we can. And then there's also the magical thinking, which means they, if children of this age, they think that either they did something wrong to cause their loved one's death, or it's something they said, um, this magical thinking of, I know I made this happen. I know it was something I did. And I also see this with young children um, and divorce. Uh, it's very interesting. How, it, I don't think we give kids credit sometimes for um, the way they think about things. They're very in tune and they do notice things. And so this magical thinking with divorce would be, I know I caused my parents divorce or separation. I know it was something I said, or it wasn't a good enough child. Um, I know I did this. And so that's that magical thinking where they, they're, they're aware of what's going on around them, but they, they have that magical thinking that they have caused something. Mm -hmm. They also could have magical thinking in, if I do this, this, and this, it'll bring that person back. Um, that, that magical thinking that I can, cause, I can cause the death, but I can also bring them back. And so just reassuring them that it's not something that they did um, and reminding them that once something has died, that that is forever. So that magical thinking is really um, kind of unique at that age. And then again, as we kind of get older as, child, as the child's understanding and developmental 
understanding changes, their understanding of death and life will definitely change as well. Um, so it, at ages nine and through 11, you know, preteen, we're gonna see more um, spiritual concepts and understanding of spiritual concepts, as well as that abstract thinking. So they're going to understand a little more about um, what does it mean when someone dies? What happens to their body? All of those things, again, they're just gonna progressively understand things more. And then when you look at teenagers or adolescents, um, you know, I always laugh because some people are so afraid of working with teens and they just think they're horrible and they won't get through to them. From my experience, that's not the case. Um, teens have a lot to, to offer to us. Their understanding is going to be very, very different. Um, and they're going to be able to process things a little bit more in depth than a younger child would. And so the other part of, of being a teenager is just fitting in. And this is also a really hard time if they have that significant death loss or just significant loss in their life that they um, want to fit in, but they feel so different than their peers. And so what we want to do is help them understand that they're not alone. There's nothing wrong with them for feeling the grief feelings or reactions that they have, um, but letting them still find out who they are as an individual and finding what works for them and their grief. Um, and so again, this is such a fun age and I'll talk a little bit more um, towards the end about when we're working with children of different ages, how we can kind of help them in different ways. But this was just a very brief um, overview of developmental stages for kids and their grief. And again, think about where they are developmentally um, not so much about the age, but what their understanding is. And that's what's really going to guide us in helping them is we knowing what their understanding is, using that to help us with how better to support them. All right, so this is a busy, busy screen of um, an activity that I do in school groups and, and groups to just kind of um, show all of the different grief reactions that someone might have after a loved one has died. And so what I do is I just say, take out a piece of paper on the top of it, write, what is grief? And then I have them say what feeling someone might feel or reactions, so physical things also that someone might feel after their loved one has died. Mm -hmm. I can't remember exactly which grade level this is. I wanna say this was from a middle school group, but I can't remember for sure. But what I really like about doing these, they're, they're called wordles or word art, is that it's a very good visual representation of what grief is. A lot of us learn what the five stages of grief are, right? We learned um, back in the day, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross came up with the five stages. Um, and we have turned those into stages of grief. What I like to help children understand and adults is that there aren't stages per se because it's not a linear process. It's, you can take two steps forward and five steps back. Um, grief can be all over the place. It's not just sadness and anger and denial and acceptance and whatever depression, whatever they are. I don't even honestly remember them, um, the five stages. But what I, I think is important to help children understand and adults is that there are so many reactions after a loss and that all of them are okay. They truly are okay to feel when you're grieving. Um, and that helps normalize all of the, the unique feelings that we all have with each loss. And so that's one of the biggest things that I think is important to remember when we're working with kids, um, when they're grieving and after a big change is we wanna normalize their experience but also acknowledge that those feelings are there and that that's okay. And letting them know that it's not bad to have all of these feelings at once. It might be overwhelming at times, but there's nothing wrong with it. And so um, the other thing I like about the wordle is just that it's all over the place, right? There's some words that are big, there are some that are small, it's not orderly, it's not linear. Uh, and so a good represent, a visual representation of what grief might feel like as well. So 
these are the new slides kind of from last week that are new from last week. I didn't get to really talk about trauma or um, what we call the adverse childhood experiences. And those of us that have worked with kids um, have probably heard of the ACEs, but these are different uh, experiences that a child may have in their life that may cause issues later on down the road. And what I tell people are, these, not every child who experiences um, these traumatic things will have ACEs. They might be okay, um, but just remembering that there are a lot of things in a child's life that can impact um, how they grow up and they develop. This, these things can also impact their grief and really affect how they are grieving and, and how they can process really their loss. And so when you look at examples of the ACEs, and I think there's 10 total, but a lot of them are, again, traumatic experiences, either that, that that child experienced personally or even witnessing them. And so there's been research that's been done on a, a child who's raised in a home where they have a caregiver who uses drugs or alcohol and how that can affect a child. Um, even if it wasn't super traumatic or what we would consider traumatic, just how that experience can definitely shape a child's life. Um, that goes as well um, for suicide. And if they have a loved one who has died by suicide and how this can really affect their life, but also affecting their grief. And that's one of the things that we touched on last week as well is how that person died or the situations around their loss and how those stigmas or taboos may affect their grief or what they feel they can share in their grief. And so I think that is incredibly similar to ACEs, is how those things that might be viewed by others as taboo or that there's a stigma attached to them, how those really can affect a child's development and how they live their life. So if you look at ACEs, the um, studies have shown how it can lead to chronic health problems, mental health, mental health issues, as well as their own substance use and abuse. Um, and so just thinking about those as a whole, but knowing that there are ways to prevent them or to help a child who has experienced an age. And really, these are things that um, we talk about of how to help grieving children. There are a lot of similarities in there. So a child having a loved one die isn't necessarily an ACE, but it definitely can add to them. And so some of the things that we can help a child who's experienced an adverse um, experience would be to, uh, the things that I really focus on and, and what I do is I, I really like this paving the way for them to reach their full potential. Helping them handle stress and manage emotions and then connecting them with caring adults. Those are some of the most important things that we can do for a child. And I think those are very true in their grief as well. How do we best help them? And like the ACEs, it really is helping them learn healthy coping skills. It's connecting them with positive um, caring adults that can help them through these difficult times as well. And so with that, I'm gonna jump right into um, how we can help kids, unless you all have some questions about developmental stages, the ACEs, I totally zoom through those ACEs. So um, if you want more information, there is a lot of information out there. Um, the CDC has some great little tools to kind of look at ACEs and how to help kids who've experienced them. All right, we're gonna get into the top 10 list of how to help grieving kids, because we all love lists and <laughs> this is how we can process things a little bit better. So the first thing that um, you can do to help a child is to get rid of your assumptions and let the child teach you, but also guide you. And so this is similar to what I talked about before about that self-awareness. What is your comfort level talking to children or talking about grief and loss? And death and dying, but also when we have those assumptions or those ideas, throwing those or put not throwing them out, but putting them aside when we're talking with children. 
because it's one thing for me to have an assumption of what they might be experiencing and feeling, but it's a whole nother thing to let them tell us what they are experiencing and what they are feeling. And this is really important because if we automatically go in there with an assumption of what's going on, we may miss things that are important to that child. And so letting their, their emotions, their comfort level, their attitude towards things, really letting that guide us with where we want to go. Um, and again, acknowledging their pain, what they're going through, letting them have that space. And that's what I really think it's about is creating a safe place for children to talk about, to share, to experience whatever it is that they are needing at that time. So a lot of that means we need to put our agenda on the back burner for now and let them really, really guide us, giving them that space and that time to share and to say what they need to say. The next one is dealing with the facts. This is so very important. And especially when we talk about working with younger children, we need to talk about the facts. What is it that I know? I know when someone dies, regardless of how they died, I know that their body stops working. They are not going to come back. They will not be able to come back. Um, and so those facts, this is important especially with a younger child or really any child who, who their loved one maybe died in a traumatic way. And I, I have on there to avoid euphemism. And that is so important because the words that we use are important to children. The language that we use is very important. And so avoiding euphemisms means that we're not going to just say um, someone passed away or we lost grandma. Um, what do you think a child hearing that any age, of any age will think if you say um, grandma passed away or we lost grandma? What do you, do you think a child, a five-year-old child will understand that completely or be confused by those terms? I often think um, the passed away, like to me, that is such a, I know what it means. We all know what it means as adults, but think about a child um, that this is their first death loss. And we say that somebody passed away uh, or that we lost someone. Their understanding is going to be very different than ours. And yeah. Um, so, um... I, I know uh, one of the little girl in my class when she was young, her father was a, her grandfather was a pastor and they found a dead bird on the beach. And her grandfather said, oh, he's gone to heaven. And, um, and she looked at him and she said, well, uh, um, did they throw him out again? You know? <laughs> Because that, that understanding is so concrete, right? And so when you say they went to heaven, but yet the body's still there, what does that mean? Right. Yeah. And so I'm really glad that you shared that because that is an experience that I've had as well, where I do think it's important to keep our cultural and religious beliefs part of our grieving and part of the explanation of death and dying. But to a small child, the concept of heaven is very, very confusing. And when we say someone went there, we think that they chose to go there or that that is where they are. And so why can't we visit them or why can't they visit us? And so I, again, I think that's very important to, to include those, those um, ideas and those philosophies, if you want to say, but also sticking to the facts of their what made them special is gone. Their body is still here. And this is what's going to happen um, at the funeral, whatever it might be. Um, but not being so, um, uh, we really need to use concrete terms with kids. And so explaining what it means when someone has died 
and when we say they go to heaven, this is what we mean. And so really, um, again, sticking to the facts so that they have that understanding. And the facts also include how that person died. And so when we talk about somebody dying very tragically or traumatic in a traumatic manner, um, we still need to explain that to a child. And a lot of times I hear people in the, that I've worked with, um, a lot of times this comes up when someone dies from suicide or from homicide or from a drug overdose. How do we explain that to a small child or to a child of any age um, that might not completely understand what those terms mean? And so a lot of it is really, again, sticking to the facts. And when someone dies from suicide, we can explain that that person died um, because they shot themselves or someone died because they took too much of a drug that made their body stop working. And so those are, those are concrete terms. And a lot of times people, um, they think, oh man, how do, I, how do I explain to a child that um, someone died from taking drugs or that someone was shot? That's a very scary thing. But the honesty or the reality is it's the honest truth. And those are facts. And so if we don't provide them with those facts, what I have seen a lot of times and what a lot of people see is that those children make up those missing pieces. They make them up in their own mind. And oftentimes what they make up in their own mind, that's going to be a lot scarier than what the truth is. And, and it goes back to, we want to be there with them and for them. And so if we're the ones telling them these, this information, it's letting them know that we're a safe person and that they can come to us when they have more questions. And so presenting the facts goes with the next one of being honest. And again, it comes down to building trust, building a relationship with that child so that they know you are a safe person to talk to, but also that it is okay to talk about death. It's okay to talk about grief and that they can ask those questions when they have them. And so being honest, um, not lying to a child, letting them know that you are that safe person, you are comfortable talking about death and grief. Um, it's building that trust with them. And, and that's so important with children because they, they, they look up to us adults, they rely on us. Um, and we wanna build a trusting relationship with them so that whether it's this time of, of a difficult time that they're going through, or if it's another time later on down the road, they'll be able to have that relationship with that person. The honesty is so important and that trust is so important. And one of my, um, the stories that I like to tell is I was presenting with uh, to a group of college students and I, one of my soapboxes sometimes is talking about um, the importance of talking about traumatic death, especially suicide, and how that isn't a, a reason that we shouldn't talk to children about death. And so I was kind of talking about that and um, afterwards a student came up to me and she was telling me how her dad died when she was about 12 years old. And at that time, she was told that he died in a car accident. And so that's what she knew that through the years, that's what she kind of grieved and processed was that he died in a car accident. When she was older, it was after she had graduated, um, she found out that her dad died from suicide. And so she said, the anger that she had and the hurt that she had was really difficult because she had to re-grieve her dad's death all over again because she learned the facts of what really happened. And so she said, I re-grieved his death all over again and processing it as a suicide and not an accident. The other thing that happened was she said, the relationship between her and her mother was very strained for several years because she said, mom, if you lied about this, what else are you lying to me about? And so she said it was like a double loss at that time. It was a loss of her dad, of course, and the grief caused by that, but it was also grief of the relationship with her mom. Thankfully, they were able to work out and you know she's very close with her mother again, but she said it took a long time for them to really work on that. And so that story has really stuck with me of yeah, that importance of honesty um, 
the other thing, like I said earlier, kids are so, so in tune with things, way more than what we give them credit for sometimes. And the problem is we aren't that trusting adult giving them that information. They probably will find it out from somebody else. And whether that's overhearing something or they um, overhear, you know, other family members talking or friend, friends talking about it or down the road, they're going to learn about the truth. And so what I really encourage people to do is if you're not sure how to explain this, or maybe you aren't able to because you yourself are grieving so much, find someone who can explain that to them. Find someone who can really help answer those questions that that child may have. So that honesty, that trust is so very important with children. The next thing um, that I like to talk about is connecting the dots, connecting the dots, excuse me. And this is really helping kids understand and teens understand who they are and how those things are very special and unique, even in their grief. A lot of times children will have some self-esteem issues that could have come up after their loved one has died. And a lot of that goes back to these feelings are very unusual. I've never felt them. I must be the only one who's ever felt this way. None of my friends have ever had a loved one who's died or have gone through this grief experience that I'm going through now. So there must be something wrong with me. I have changed. So what we want to do is help children understand that they are still the unique and special person that they are, and they still are them. That makes sense. They're still who they are. And so what we want to help them understand is even though they've had this huge change in their life, they're still themselves. And one of the ways that we can help them connect the dots and kind of connecting the dots of who they were before this, this um, loss and this grief and who they are now. How do we help them connect the dots in that? And so helping them understand that they can still enjoy the things that they've always enjoyed, but how do they use those things, those hobbies, those passions to express their grief and to process their grief? Um, how do they use those talents to honor their loved ones? Again, finding those things that make them who they are, the special person that they truly are. How can we use that to help them process their grief? Um, a lot of times that's coping skills. So um, I work with a child who really likes music and he actually plays different instruments and actually composes and writes lyrics and all kinds of things. Music is so important to children and to adults, a lot of us in our grief. But one of the things that I'm working with this child on is how can he use his love of music to honor his loved one who died but also to process his grief. And so um, it's a very, it's, it's a really interesting way for him to look at it because it's something he's done for years, but he didn't really look at it as a way of, of a coping skill or a way of honoring his loved one. So helping them find those things that they already enjoy doing, but how can they, how can that become a coping skill or how can that become a way that I honor my loved ones? So really connecting those dots. Um, ritual and memorialization is really, really important. Um, I, some of you that were here last week, um, I talked about working at a funeral home and that was um, a way that I personally saw the importance of rituals even more so. Um, rituals are really important in our grief because they provide some normalcy, they provide connection with other people, um, rituals are a way that we recognize a special moment in time. And so having some kind of ritual to say goodbye to someone is really important. And there's lots of ways that we can do that. Um, right now, I know that's something that a lot of people are struggling with because funeral services are not the same as they usually are. And whether that's, um, you know, we can't have as many people gathering, or maybe it's we can't have a gathering at all or a ritual at all. But before the whole pandemic, there were also times that people weren't able to be part of a funeral service. 
maybe they weren't able to physically go somewhere because they were just too far away and they weren't able to attend that funeral service. Maybe there wasn't a funeral service. Maybe there were tensions in the family that they weren't able to attend for whatever reason. So what I like to do with children and adults is create a ritual yourself. Create that funeral service yourself. Um, and that's something I'm really encouraging people to do right now when funerals might be either on hold or um, they're just not being able to be held in the same way. How can we still have a ritual ourselves? And for children, um, it's really important to include them in this process and to include them in that ritual process. Let them come up with ideas that they can do. Um, the one picture on, the, it's on my left of the balloon, um, that's a dove balloon. And it's actually from a grief group that I did where the children decorated it. Um, these are biodegradable balloons. They're shaped like doves, they're giants. Um, and it's such a neat activity for the, for the students to do. Um, and then we had a balloon release. Um, we, we went outside and we had a little, um, just a little reading and then we released the balloon. And it was really special. And that's something families can do as well. Um, I really encourage biodegradable <laughs> balloons if you are to do a balloon release. Um, but there's a lot of different things that you can do. I also tell people it doesn't have to be something huge and um, you know that there's a lot of people that takes a lot of preference and you know this big ordeal. It doesn't have to be that. A ritual can be something very small, very simple, but it can still be meaningful. And so finding that thing that is meaningful to you, maybe it's lighting a candle um, and playing a song that they like or reading a poem or doing something to honor them. Maybe it's playing a game in honor of them. Um, so helping them understand the importance of ritual and how those rituals help, our, help, our process, help us to process our grief. And it really kind of is the start for a lot of people. And so um, if they can have that ritual to say goodbye to them, um, to their loved ones, is really, really important. The same goes for non-death losses. You know, um, I think about the pandemic and right now and how so much has changed for a lot of us and even children. How do we help them? Um, you know, maybe they're not able to go to school and be with their friends. How do we help them process that, um, that loss, that change? Um, maybe they moved, um, where moving can be a loss and it causes grief for a child. Um, so how do we create a ritual before we move out of our old house? Is there something we can do? Or when we move into the new house, is there something that we can do to create a ritual to help them start processing their grief and their loss and this change, really? So at the end of this present, at the end of the slides, because I didn't get to it last week, I do have some information on funerals that if I have time, I definitely, because that is something that I really um, think is important of how to include children in the funeral process. But really, uh, the big thing is just recognizing the importance of creating a ritual to acknowledge the loss, to acknowledge the grief. Um, and again, it doesn't have to be anything huge and fancy. It could be something very, very simple, but letting the children decide, children decide what they want to do. I put um, a little picture of one of my favorite books, The Invisible String. I don't know if any of you have read that, but it's a, a powerful book that I think all ages can get something out of. But I also believe that there's a lot of children books that us adults can learn from. And so The Invisible String is an amazing book that can be used for any type of loss or change. And it talks about how even though we can't see that person and they might not be with us physically, there's still a connection to them. And that's what The Invisible String is. And so it can be used for the uh, death loss, but it can be used for someone who is incarcerated, someone who's caregiver or parent isn't in their life for whatever reason. Um, it's just a really good book that can be used for several different situations. And so I really strongly encourage you to uh, look it up if you're looking for a good uh, resource or book for children, for a child. The fifth thing is connecting with community resources. 
know what resources are out there in your community. I can tell you there's one great one called Hope West Kids. Um, and I say it's great because, well, I oversee it here in Delta. So I think it's wonderful. <laughs> but know what resources are in your community. At the end of this presentation, I'll also provide you guys or you all with um, some different resources that are national resources as well. Um, that's the great thing. I have this love-hate relationship with technology, but I love it that we have so many resources that are national or worldwide that we can get at any time. And that really gives us a, a different variety of support and resources. And so I'll, I'll get you that list at the end, but know what is available here. The biggest thing um, that I, I think um, is important to keep in mind is how are their peers supporting them through this? And the peers are their classmates, their friends, their siblings, but also us as a community. Um, how are we supporting grieving children? And that's really, I mean, obviously you all that are here and listening to this, you have that desire, you have a want to support grieving children. And so one of the best things that we can do again is create that safe place for them, letting them know that there isn't anything wrong with them. It's not wrong to grieve. It's not wrong to feel all the different feelings that we might feel. Just normalizing that for them and letting them know that you're a safe person. And again, creating that safe place for them. Um, so I will say with Hope West Kids, things are a little different right now because of the pandemic. Um, just some of the services that we provide um, I am able to still see children individually, and that's either um, telehealth, so via Zoom, um, I can do it that way, or as of today, right now, I am still able to see children in person at my office. And so I am located here in Delta, and like I said, as of today, that could change. I, you know, that's something that's constantly changing so that we are doing it in a safe way. Um, but I am able to see children individually and telehealth, uh, that's always available. And the great thing about telehealth is it doesn't matter where that child is or where I am at, we can connect in some way. Uh, so that is one of the biggest things that we are offering right now with Hope West Kids. The other thing, um, we will eventually be doing some school support again. Um, I've been working with a lot of the counselors in our, in our local schools around here, just how we can do that moving forward. Uh, and I know um, there in Paonia, I've talked with several of the staff there at your school, and um, there will be something in the, in the works next semester. Um, but know that um, if you have a need, I will work with someone to meet that, that need. Uh, and so it's going to look very different right now. We don't have any in-person groups at this time scheduled. Um, however, in the, in the spring, early winter, spring of next year, I'm hoping to get some virtual groups going in addition to some school groups. So if you have a need, again, please reach out. My contact information, I'll have that at the end as well. Um, and and if, if there is something that you're needing, please still reach out. Even in this time of change, I'm still able to provide support to our community. So number four talks about identifying the secondary losses. And this is something that is so important for kids um, and for adults as well to understand that it's not just the death or the loss of that person that we're grieving. There's a lot of other things caused by that death that we, were, we will grieve as well. And so the primary loss is the death of a person or um, in the case of, of someone, a couple separating or getting a divorce, that's the primary loss. The secondary losses are everything that changes because of that. And I think these are really important to remember because um, these are the things that might cause just as much grief and hardship for a child, or again, anybody of any age. And so when we talk about the death of someone, and say that person is a caregiver, a primary caregiver, a parent of that child. Um, that could mean that now they only have one income in the house. 
they may have to move. That might have been the person who got them up every morning and got helped get them dressed. That might have been the person who made their lunch or took them to school or picked them up or helped them with their homework. And so those are all secondary losses because it's something that has changed because of the primary loss. And so when we talk to children or when we're working with a child, asking them, what else has changed since your loved one died? Or what has changed since your loved one um, went to prison? What, what are those things? And what that does is, one, it'll help us identify ways that we can support them. It's going to help them also understand why loss and grief can seem so overwhelming at times. Um, with adults and older teens, one of the things I've had them do is write down all of the secondary losses that you have had after your loved one died. And I usually send them home with that. That's you know a project that they do on their own to give them some time. And I, I, I tell them, don't get overwhelmed. Don't get frustrated when you see all of these changes. What I want you to think about are these are things um, that are usually have a solution to them. Um, and again, that's how we can identify how to help them. But that's also a way that they can have their, their support network identify ways to help them as well. Um, with kids, there's, and again, with all ages, but especially with a child, it may be those future losses that they're really grieving. Um, who, who they won't get to see me graduate. They won't get to see me go to prom. Um, who's going to walk me down the aisle if I get married? All of those things, or even something like the daddy daughter dance, those are losses that that child will, will experience that are things that they haven't got to experience with that person. I had a little boy tell me once after his brother died, it was an older brother, and he said, I didn't get to know him like my other brothers did. And that was a loss to him. He won't have that relationship with that brother like his other siblings have. And so um, the loss of the future is the secondary loss that that child may grieve. And so really keeping that in the back of our mind when we're working with children, that there are other things. It's not just the physical loss of someone that they're going to grieve. There's a lot of other things and other changes in their life that they may grieve. Validate all feelings. Again, letting them know that it's okay to feel whatever they're feeling. Um, also explaining that there's physical reactions, there's other reactions that may happen after their loved one has died. It's not just sadness. And so validating all feelings and experiences, and especially anger. Anger is a very, very common emotion in grief. Um, but it's not one that we talk about a lot. And it might be one that people are un more uncomfortable with. Um, I'm not an angry person, or I was told I shouldn't feel angry. I hear a lot of kids, when I ask them about good and bad feelings, they say anger is a bad feeling. And what I want to help them understand, or what we can help them understand, is it's not bad to be angry, but it's what we do with it that is either good or not so good. And so when we validate their feelings, we let them know that it's okay. But what we want to do then is help them find healthier ways to express them. And so you'll see um, the, little, the little picture here is uh, from an elementary age student who I was working with. And I said, well, what do you do when you're having a bad day? And these are coping skills. That's what we would call them. What are your coping skills? I'm not going to say that to a, to a child. I'm going to ask them, what helps you get through those tough times? What can you do when you're having a bad day? And if you look at this list, um, first of all, their spelling is amazing. It looks like words I would spell and the way I would spell them. But to them, it made a lot of sense. And it's, again, finding a way, helping them connect those dots dots and finding what things that they already enjoy doing and how do they use those to help themselves through a difficult time. Um, and what we're providing for them are those coping skills that they can use right now 
in their loss and in their grief, but also hopefully in the future. If we can help them develop good coping skills with grief now, and fortunately we know that they will still have losses throughout their life. So if we can help them with those coping skills now, it can help them throughout their life. And that's really what we want to um, provide them with and really guide them in is finding those healthy coping skills. Modeling and teaching how to honor life. We talked about earlier of how important rituals are and how helpful those can be. But we also want to let them know that um, how helpful it can be to continue to honor their loved one after their death. Um, so we can do things to honor someone. Again, lighting a candle, uh, playing a, a song that they really liked, sharing memories of them. That is one of the things, especially us adults who knew that person who died, sharing those memories with that child so that they can continue to get to know them even after their death. That's really helpful um, to share those memories that we have because that's a way that we are honoring them. We're letting them know that we can still talk about someone who's died long after their death, but it's also giving them those, those memories that maybe they didn't have with that person. So there's things that we can do, but there's also ways that we can live our life that, are, that can be honoring to someone. And so I call those gifts. We all get gifts from people that we meet throughout our life. Um, and so that might be uh, a gift of uh, humor or understanding. Uh, I always say my aunt um, who died several years ago, one of the things that she really taught me was the importance of family and the importance of those people who we care about and letting them know how important they are to us. So that was a gift that she gave me, and it's still something I think about today, just the importance of those loved ones in our lives. And so helping children understand those gifts that they might have gotten from someone and how we live our life can, can, can honor that person long after their death as well. And then finally, what I think is the most important, honestly, the most important thing that we can do with children is just listen. Providing that safe place for them to share, to talk about whatever they need to talk about, just creating that safe place for them. Um, I always say we have two ears and one mouth for a reason. You need to listen more and not talk so much. Letting a child share whatever it is that they need to share. Not assuming that we know what they're experiencing. Let them tell us what they're experiencing. Let them guide us. Also, not um, asking them 20 questions and um, really letting them lead us in what information they are needing. Um, <laughs> we don't want to we don't want to assume that a child is feeling a way, but we also don't want to like put so much information on them that they're completely overwhelmed. Kids will be kids, even in their grief. And what I mean by that is kids will want the information and you can talk to them and they may want to talk about it for five minutes and then they'll go out and they'll play. And then they'll come back and they might have a question or two to ask and they'll ask them and then they'll go back out and play. What I really encourage adults to do is to let them ask those questions in their own time. They're going to process it by playing. They're going to process it by being kids and then coming back and asking that question. And so letting them, letting them still be kids, even in their grief, uh, letting them come and ask questions when they have them. But really just providing that safe place for them to ask questions for them to share, for them just to be processing their grief. That's so, so important. The power of listening um, is really important. And I don't think we, um, we always acknowledge that. I feel that sometimes we, we may feel like we need to have answers for everything, or we're so afraid of what that child might ask that we don't talk about it at all, or 
we discourage that discussion from really happening. So what we can do is really just let them talk. There isn't a lot of things that you are going to say wrong. Truthfully, there isn't. Um, yes, there are more harmful things that we could say, but what I tell people is please don't avoid the conversation completely because you're uncomfortable with it. Let that child have that safe place. Let them talk, let them share, and just be there for them. That's with your nonverbal um, emotion or your nonverbal communications as well. So creating that safe place is a non um, is what verbal communication we're using, but also how are we creating a safe caring environment for them? So that is the top 10 list of things um, that you can do to help grieving children. Does anyone have any questions, comments, things that have worked for them, things that have not worked for them? Anything on that top 10 list that you all would like to add to? Hopefully that makes sense to everyone. And again, I will get you all the copy of the PowerPoint so you'll have the, all that information as well if you would like that. This is really very nice, Carrie. Thank you so much. I did have a child whose mother committed suicide um, when I was teaching in Boulder. And um, I had no idea how to um, meet her. But I did have, uh, I was doing um, Greek history and uh, or Roman history, and we it was starting with Aeneas, and Aeneas went to, um, I can't remember the country now, it was in North Africa, Carthage. And uh, Dido was the teacher, was the, uh, the queen of, the, of Carthage. And um, she fell in love with Aeneas. And I had to tell the story and Aeneas um, also fell in love with her, but he felt his destiny was to go and found a, a new city, which was Rome. So he left her and she threw herself on a pyre. Um, he turned around and there was a huge smoke and he realized that she had jumped into this funeral pyre and had killed herself. And I was telling the story to this girl who was part of the class. And um, I, I don't know, I wasn't, you know, I don't know how that affected her. Yeah. And again, I think it's that um, suicide, unfortunately, is a stigmatized death. And so a lot of us, um, or a lot of people might not be comfortable with that. And so we, we don't know what to say, right? We don't know. And so a lot of times, unfortunately, what happens is because we're so uncomfortable with it, we don't talk about it at all. And mm -hmm. so I, what I encourage you all to do is still talk about it, even and especially with those stigmatized deaths, still provide the same type and degree and level of support as you would to someone whose loved one died from natural causes or something that isn't so stigmatized. And what that really, again, goes back to is presenting the facts, what you are able to present. And I know that all of us have different roles within the community, within a school, within an organization, um, that maybe that information isn't coming from us, it's coming from the principal or whomever it might be. But what uh, we- what, oh, what, about, what about story? you know, that something that happened to somebody else in, you know, because uh, her mother committed suicide because her father fell in love with someone else. And so the, here's the story. I mean, does that story, is that too um, intense for them? No, and, and again, it's the reality of it, right? Like that's mm -hmm. reality. And I think that stories or bibliotherapy, if you want to mm -hmm. call it, is mm -hmm. a one of the best ways that we can talk about death and grief and loss with children. Um, and so, yes, that's a, a story about, you know, ancient Rome and all of that, but yet it's still relevant and it still is normalizing it. It's still talking about it in not such a, I don't want to say contra, um, it's, it's a way that is a little more 
accessible, if you want to say, but also a little easier to ease into that conversation. Because mm -hmm. what we can do after reading a story or reading a book with a child is start that, that's a way to start that discussion and open up that door. And so after those stories or those books that we read, it's talking mm -hmm. with them. So, you know, how does this relate to today, especially when we talk about like ancient Rome and Greece, you know, that was so long ago, but mm -hmm. it's still relevant to today, right? And so the same goes for storybooks. There's a lot of books out there. Um, I didn't include a book, a listing of books, but if anyone wants a, book, a list of books that I personally use, I would be very, very happy to get those to you. Mm -hmm. But what it does is it starts that conversation in a very uh, easy way, a very natural way, um, mm -hmm. especially with young children. That's what I encourage parents to do. It, um, if they're maybe a little more uneasy with talking about death and grief with their child, um, I recommend starting with a book and read that book with the child and then start that discussion of, you know, in this story, um, Rocky's friend died. Mm -hmm. Kind of like how your friend died. Mm -hmm. What did that, what did Rocky do in the story? Is that something you felt? Um, and so again, it's that discussion. It's starting that discussion in a, in a non-threatening way. And again, it's a very natural thing that we do anyways with children is to read to them. And so how do we use that as a way to talk about death and dying and grief? Um, and so I do think stories are a way that we can relate. Um, it's providing a character that something happened to this character but I, as a child or even adult, I can relate to that as well. Mm -hmm. It takes away that loneliness, it normalizes it, and it really can start that discussion in a really easy way. Um, Thank so, you. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to just scroll ahead. And, and again, children and funerals, it's really great. If anybody wants a discussion with me, I'm happy to talk to them about it. Um, I'm also a quote person, and I saw this quote the other day um, talking about change, and I just thought it was really fitting when we talk about working with grieving kids. Um, again, it's, it's uncomfortable. We, as a society, don't do a very good job about talking about uncomfortable things. Um, I say we often lean away or we like get away from difficult conversations because it's just hard. But what I encourage you all to do is to lean into it, lean into that uncomfortableness, lean into the grief. Um, and if even one person can be that trusted adult in that child's life and be that person who talks about their grief, man, it really does make a difference. Um, and I like the ripple effect of, you know, when we, when we can work with someone, when we can provide them with a trusting relationship, what that ripple effect can do and how many other people can be positively or negatively affected by what we are doing and in our actions. Um, but please just think about how you can be that one person in that child's life who can become that trusted adult, who can become that person that they can come to when they're grieving, when they're going through that difficult time. How can you be that person in that child's all right, any questions, comments, experiences that you all have shared that you would like to share with us? I was just gonna say, say Carrie, I really liked your presentation. I think you should do it for our staff. Um, but I was just trying to think about the list you gave, because a lot of times when I'm working with kids, we have to sometimes work through the parent filter um, or even in cultural situations. But I feel like thinking about it more, even this list allows you to ask those open-ended questions. And then that child provides those answers that will provide either that family structure or cultural structure. So it's really not providing anything. It's just providing that support. So I really, it was really great. Exactly. And, and I think that's so important to remember is that we don't have to have those answers and we won't have the answers. I always 
joke um, with kids and adults, but I don't have that magical wand of things to say. Just because I'm, you know, a quote unquote expert in this field, I'm not an expert in their grief. They are the expert in their grief. What I want to do is just create that place that they can feel comfortable enough to share that with me, but also comfortable enough to start processing that. And so, yeah, it's not having those magical words to take it all away. We cannot do that. We can't take away their grief. But what we can do is provide that support to them. Um, and, and so that's really what that I hope that you all can do as well. So thank you for that, Heidi. I have another question. Yeah. Um, the other question I had was when I had a boy in first grade whose mother had died of cancer and he came into the class and I had told the children that, you know, his mom had uh, got, died and that we should be really kind to him. And he walked in and somebody said, your mother died. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, it, it was it was shocking and I didn't I realized I, I probably didn't prepare the the class to receive him I mean that's a question how do you prepare the rest of the children yeah well and I think you know what to me I laugh when you say that because his mother did die right like that's a fact and so yeah. kids are so concrete and they're thinking that to that child I don't know I can't say but that might not have been offensive to him. Maybe it was, maybe it was the way the child said it. But to me, it's more of that's a fact and that child even acknowledged that. And so what I hear from kids is sometimes they, their friends don't know. And so there's this, this unknown that, and they don't wanna to have to tell their story to everybody. Uh -huh. And so, um, man, I wish I had more time to kind of give you more of those guidelines of how you say it. But it is presenting the facts in, in a classroom situation, especially, or in like a group of friends um, yeah. who their friend had a loved one who died, is presenting the facts. What do we know? We know that Johnny's mom died. She died from cancer. She died last night. You know, providing those facts to them. The problem with that is anymore, we have social media, we have, you know, the internet that a lot of times word travels much faster um, mm -hmm. than what it used to. And mm -hmm. so a lot of times they're going to be hearing things anyway, or especially mm -hmm. if it's a small community, um, if it's that group of friends, they may have already heard it. But what we want to do is provide facts of what we know and then open it up to questions that they have. And letting friends, classmates ask those questions as well so that we can give them that information so they're not getting misinformation. I also tell people that I don't know is an answer and an acceptable answer to questions. And so if a child asks something and you don't know the answer, don't make it up, don't lie, don't tell half truths. Just say, I don't know, but let me look into that. I don't know, but let me ask Mr. Smith. I, he'll have the answer and I'll get back to you mm -hmm. and then get back to them. Um, and then explaining kind of the same things that we talked about today of how to help their friend. The biggest one is to still be their friend, to listen to them, to let them know that that friend may experience different feelings that they've never showed before. They might cry, um, letting them know that that's okay. And what they can do as a friend is to still play with them the same way that they always have, to let them Mm. cry if they need to cry or be angry but mm. then also letting the group of peers know that you are a safe person so if they have questions later on or if they need to ask something come to you and again it's creating that safe place to ask questions to listen to them but really just to normalize it and let them know that their friend or their classmate is still that person um, and how we can support them is letting them experiencing their grief um, and also just listening to them. Um, so those are some different things that you can do, um, very similar to what we talk about. Again, those peers can do the same thing of listening, of validating, helping them in a ritual, um, helping them find things that, that are good coping skills. Kids can do that. Peers can do that with their friends as well. So hopefully that was 
helpful in a way. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I wanted to very quickly tell you all about an event that is coming up that um, the Cedar Ridge United Methodist Church is actually going to be presenting. Um, but they're having a um, Allison Gilbert. She's a great um, speaker. She's out of New York, um, a nationally recognized speaker. We wouldn't normally have this opportunity um, to have a speaker come and talk in person, just because honestly, a lot of times that's a lot of financial responsibility to bring somebody in. However, um, because of the pandemic, we can do a lot of things by Zoom now. And so um, Allison Gilbert is going to be speaking on November 19th. Um, and it is $20 per person. Uh, the, the website's there. When I send this out, it will be electronic. So you should be able to click on it. Um, or if you go on Facebook and you look up Cedar Edge United Methodist Church, it is on their Facebook page as well. Um, but I really encourage you, if you are interested in hearing some more information about um, grief, but Allison's um, topic or her, her presentation will be about the holidays, really specific to the holidays, but also the holidays during COVID. Um, and so uh, please, please, please help um, spread the word if you would like to attend, um, either go to their that website or on Facebook, like I said, on the Met United Methodist Churches page, you can find that information as well. Um, one of the things I didn't put any information on it, but in the next week or so um, at local coffee shops, uh, we are going to be putting out little strips of paper for Children's Grief Awareness Day, which is also November 19th. Um, Children's Grief Awareness Day is something that the National Alliance for Grieving Children had uh, created many years ago. And it's a day to really recognize supporting grieving children. And what we're going to do this year is put out little slips of paper that adults and community members can write messages to children um, who are grieving. Messages of hope, messages of inspiration, whatever they might want to do. And what we'll do is we will take those slips of paper and we're going to create a chain of hope with them. And that will be displayed here at our office at Hope West um, here in Delta. Uh, but I will be getting those out to the community. So keep your eyes out if you want to, or if you have a message and you want to send it to me, I would be happy to write that on a slip of paper and include it in the chain of hope. Uh, but Children's Grief Awareness Day, November 19th, um, we will be having some more information on our Facebook page, the Hope West Facebook page. So keep your eyes out for that. These are just um, a few of the resources that are out there. There are a ton of them. Um, for children, one of the best ones I find is National Alliance for Grieving Children, NAGC. They have a lot of really great resources there um, for um, specific to mostly death loss. They have come up with some really great COVID related um, resources. Uh, if you're looking for that, please, please, please check out NAGC. Um, the Association for Deaf Education and Counseling, I will say they have great information for um, like community members, but they also have great information for us professionals and for you as professionals as well. Um, ADEC is another really great national organization. What's Your Grief is one of my favorite um, blogs. They have videos, they have resources for many types of loss. And so they are not just death loss specific. They have some other great resources as well available. So check them out. They also have great little challenges that they do, like a photo challenge they did a couple months ago. Um, so What's Your Grief is a wonderful resource. The Dougie Center is also specific to children's loss or grief. Um, and so they have some, again, podcasts, they have some different resources, handouts. And then if you're looking for books that are grief related, Centering Corporation is one of the best ones that I have found that it's kind of a one stop shop, if you want to say, um, for grief resources. What I like about Centering Corporation is they have um, different topics. So death of a child, stillbirth, 
death of a parent, um, for they have information for children, for teens, for adults, um, after a, the, an overdose death, um, when someone dies from suicide, they have resources there. So they are one of the, what I have found, one of the best grief resources um, out there and um, pretty good quality of books and resources as well. And here, finally, is my contact information, my email address, and my phone number. So if you have questions after tonight, if you have something that you, you know, you sit and you think about this, if you're like me, I have, it takes me a bit to process things sometimes. And so if you have questions or need later on after tonight, please feel free to contact me. Like I said, this is my contact information. I'm happy to be a resource for you all. And that is a picture of my little dog because she's really cute and I just have to include her on everything. So I will also get this out to anyone who would like copies of our PowerPoint of the PowerPoint so that you can have this as well to kind of, if you weren't able to take all the notes tonight, um, you can have that and I'll get that out to you all as well. All right, I am going to stop sharing and we're back up everybody. Any questions, comments, anything else that I can be a resource for you all for this evening? All right, hopefully. Um, I was just going to the comments to make sure I didn't miss anything in the chat box. Um, but please, if anyone, if you if you have questions, needs after tonight, please, please, please reach out. I'm very happy to help in whatever way that I can. I just want to say how helpful this has been for my uh, grief process now and how um, learning about the grief process as a child and understanding all the different ways of grief has made me be so much more compassionate to myself and my grief process when I was younger and also now. So that's just been a really cool side. Uh, bonus thing to all this. So thank you very much. You're so welcome. Thank you, Rose. I appreciate that. And I think that is important to think about. We continually grow and evolve, right, in our life and in our grief as well. And so I think what we learn as children can really shape how we support other kids or children now. And so I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, so thank you. All right. If there is nothing else, thank you all of you for being here too. And again, taking that time to say, I want to learn more about how to support, support grieving children because again, it's a community effort um, and it takes all of us. And I do think that we can um, create safe environments for children and that's really the goal. Um, so thank you all for being here and for uh, participating tonight. I really appreciate that. Thanks so much, Carrie. It's been really great. Helpful resources and great instruction. Thanks so much. Yes. Thanks, Thanks everyone for participating. Yeah, I hope you all have a good evening. Stay warm and stay safe out there. Mm -hmm. Me too. Bye. <laughs>